In the last couple of videos, what we've looked at is, first of all, some properties that functions may or may not have, namely injectivity, surjectivity, and bijectivity. We then looked at properties to do with invertibility of functions. We defined left and right inverses and two-sided inverses for functions. We're now going to connect those two properties. Specifically, we're going to prove a number of theorems which tell us um, precisely when a function has left or right or two-sided inverses uh, according to whether it has the various properties of injectivity, surjectivity or bijectivity. And on this first slide, we're going to prove the theorem at the top here which says that a function has a left inverse if and only if that function is injective. And I want to begin by setting up some notation that we're going to use throughout this video, which is that f will be a function from a set x to a set y, and in fact x will be a non-empty set. So let's try and prove the theorem on um, the theorem at the top of this slide here. A function has a left inverse if and only if it's injective. If you're struggling to remember any of the definitions, I've copied them all at the bottom of the page for you here. So we have um, two things to prove because this is an if and only if statement. So let's suppose first of all that f has a left inverse. So that would be a function g from y to x with the property that g composed with f will be the identity on x. And in this case, we have to argue that f must be injective or one-to-one. -one. But that's fairly easy to do. Um, you'll look at the definition of injectivity uh, at the bottom here. We need to take two elements, a and b of x. Suppose that f of a equals f of b and prove that in that case, a must be equal to b. So we'll suppose that um, a and b are elements of x and f of a equals f of b. Then we can simply apply the function g to both sides of this equation to get g of f of a equals g of f of b. Now, by assumption, g is a left inverse to f. And if g is a left inverse to f, then g of f of a is just a again. And similarly, g of f of b is b. So what this equation says is that a equals b. Uh, we've proved that if f of a equals f of b, then a equals b, and that is injectivity of f. Okay, we now have to do the other slightly more complex direction where we show that if a function is injective, then it has a left inverse. So we'll do this uh, here. So let's say now, suppose f is injective. We're going to prove then that um, f has a left inverse. And we're going to do that by constructing a function which is a left inverse to f. And the construction we're going to use is going to look, it's going to be the one that's illustrated in this diagram you can see on the right over here. So what the diagram is supposed to suggest is that the arrows pointing from left to right will be illustrating what the function f does. And the arrows pointing in the opposite direction from y to x will be illustrating what its left inverse is going to do. So let's begin, and, um, and the way our proof is going to start is by choosing at random uh, an element of the set x. So we're going to let x0 be any element in x. Uh, we just need this uh, in the course of the proof, as you're going to see. So we're now going to choose, we, now, we want to define a function from uh, the set y to the set x. And we're going to do that by thinking about a particular element of, um, of the set y. So 
So we're going to call this uh, left inverse that we're constructing G. And the way we're going to do it is as follows. We have to say what G does to an arbitrary element, little y and big y. And there's going to be two cases. The first case is going to be what happens when y is not in the image of f. So if little y is not in the image of f, then in fact what g does to y doesn't matter as far as being a left inverse to f is concerned. The definition of being a left inverse to f means that g composed with f must be the identity. So that doesn't impose any restrictions on what G does to things which aren't in the image of F. So if Y is not in the image of F, we simply define G of Y to be this particular thing, X0, which we fixed at the start. And as I say, it does not matter at all what X0 is. The tricky case is when Y is in the image of F. And this is where we use the one-to-one -one property for f. So if y is in the image of f, then y is equal to f of x for a unique little x in big X. The reason that it's unique is because f is one-to-one. -one. So if f of x1 and is equal to y and f of x2 is equal to y then f of x1 is equal to f of x2 so x1 is equal to x2 by injectivity by the fact that f is injective okay so what we do is then we simply define g of y to be this unique x with the property that f of x is equal to y. Then g of f of x is equal to x for any little x in big X. Okay, that means that g composed with f is the identity function on x, and that means that g is a left inverse to f as required. Okay, we've now done both directions of this proof, so we're ready to move on. So before we do that, let's just think how this maps up with the, matches up with the picture that I drew. So over here um, in the picture you can see that we chose this x0 in x and the meaning of x0 in our construction was that any element of y which was not in the image of f got sent to x0. So here I remind you that the arrows going from x to y are telling you what f does and the only element of y which is not in the image of f is this thing y3 and that you can see is being sent by g back to x0. On the other hand if we have things which are in the image of f, such as, well, in this case, um, y0, y1, and y2, then those are equal to f of something in x, and in fact, f of one unique element of x. So x2 gets mapped to x0, uh, y0 in my picture, x1 gets mapped to y1 in my picture, and x0 gets mapped to y2 in my picture. So in that case, we were forced to define our function g to send uh, the y0, for example, to the unique x which f mapped to y0. So in this case, g has to send y0 to x2, and it must send y1 to x1 and y2 to x0. So this fits in with what we were talking about in the last lecture about a left inverse g to f undoing what f did. OK, let's move on now to the next result, which is that a function has a right inverse if and only if it's surjective. I am not going to prove this one. This is going to be on a problem sheet that you do. And so I will just write this is going to be on an exercise 
exercise. This is an exercise for you. Okay, um, I will publish solutions to the problem sheets later on. So if you don't manage to solve this, you'll at least get be able to read my solution on the solutions to the exercise sheet. Okay, so moving on to our final result then. Our final, um, the final result that we're going to prove is that a function is invertible if and only if it's a bijection. And again, I've copied there at the bottom for you a reminder of the meaning of all these terms, especially invertible or two-sided invertible and bijection. So again, this is an if and only if statement, so we have uh, two things that we have to do. So let's first of all begin by um, supposing that we have our function f being invertible. So we'll suppose f is invertible. Well, if it's invertible, then in particular it's injective and it's surjective. Uh, excuse me, that was the wrong thing to say. If it's invertible, it has both a left inverse and a right inverse. That's the definition of being invertible. So a function which is invertible is one which has an inverse. And by definition, a function which has an inverse, inverse means two-sided inverse, so it has a left and a right inverse. So if a function is invertible, then it has a left inverse and a right inverse. But we've already proved that if it has a left inverse, then it must be injective. And taking the result from your problem sheet for granted, um, if it has a right inverse, then it must be surjective. Okay, we've established that f is injective and surjective so when we put those two things together, that means that f is a bijection. OK, so this was the easy direction. We now have some work to do in the other direction. We've shown that if f is invertible, then it is a bijection. Now we have to show that if it's a bijection, then it's invertible. So let's suppose f is a bijection. Well, if it's a bijection, then it's injective and surjective. And again, using the real results that we've already proved, if f is injective, it must have a left inverse. So let's give its left inverse a name. Let's call it G. Equally, F is surjective. So by the result from your exercise sheet, F has a right inverse. And here's the problem, right? We have a left inverse G. We have a right inverse, which we should call H. We've got no reason to believe yet that G and H are equal to one another. And that's a problem because the definition of two-sided invertible, which is what we're trying to prove about the function F, is that there is one function, so and down here, one function which is both a left and a right inverse to F at the same time. So I need to prove that actually, in this case, G is equal to H. And once I've done that, I'll have found a function which is both a left and a right inverse to F, and therefore I'll have shown that F is invertible. So this we can do just by playing a few games with composition. So what we're going to do is we're going to just exploit some properties of function composition. So first of all, g 
is equal to g composed with the identity on the right. So it should be the identity um, on the set y. Uh, remember that f is a function from x to y. Uh, that's because we proved that if you compose on either side of um, with the identity function, then you just get the same function you started off with. We did this a couple of lectures ago. Okay, so I'm now going to say, well, the identity on y, that's equal to f composed with h, precisely because h is a right inverse to, a, to f. Okay, what can we do now? Um, we have a function composition, and we know that function composition is associative. So I can re-bracket this like this, because function composition is associative. So let's just say by associativity. Okay, what do I know now? I know that G is a left inverse to F. And if g is left inverse to f, then g composed with f is the identity on x. And finally, as I said before, when you compose with the identity, you don't change anything. So the identity composed with h is just h again. So what have we got? If we follow these chain of equalities through, we've got g is equal to h, and therefore, g, which is equal to h, is a two-sided inverse to f. Uh, we've shown that if f is a bijection, then it has a two-sided inverse, so we've completed our proof.